What is free will? Do we have free will? That's the big question. Free will is such a big question that the John Templeton Foundation has funded a multi-year study with experts in science, philosophy, and theology. The project is called Big Questions in Free Will. It has 60 participants, four conferences, numerous experiments and papers, all to research, test, discuss, and debate free will. In part one, I tracked how scientists and philosophers are advancing the debate. Now, in part two, I follow the project to its conclusion, exploring the psychological, moral, and social aspects of free will. I am Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth follows the project, asking the big questions in free will. The four-year Big Questions in Free Will project is based in Tallahassee, Florida, on the campus of Florida State University. But why dedicate multiple years and significant resources to exploring free will? What makes free will a big question? Free will is a big question because humans struggle with understanding it. Humans have this need to explain and to postulate something like free will helps you understand why certain actions are unique, why certain things are unpredictable, why certain things are new, because somebody freely, creatively did something that you didn't expect would happen before. Free will lies at the heart of our conception of ourselves and our conception of being morally responsible agents. So if people feel like they have free will, they feel like they're in control of their lives and they feel like what they do matters. And if they don't feel like they have free will, they feel like what they do is not making an impact on the world. And that relates to our conceptions of moral responsibility, and it might end up affecting the way we understand legal responsibility as well. I think of free will as a new kind of con controlling and producing behavior that was produced by evolution, uh, but that sets us apart from other creatures. We have basic desires the same as they do. Every animal gets hungry, and when it gets hungry, it wants to eat. We do that too, but we might refrain from eating because we're on a diet, or it's a religious holiday, or the food belongs to someone else, or free will is one of the basic human traits. Some people are going around saying there's no such thing as free will, it's an illusion, blah, blah, blah. I think people are upset by that, uh, partly because it denies one of the basic facts of human experience. So free will is a big question because it affects how we live our lives and structure our societies and, deeply, what we are as human beings. I begin with neuroscientist Patrick Haggard, who asserts that the neuroscience of free will explains how we, as social animals, control our behavior. Patrick studies the way we make decisions and change our minds. I've been interested in the strength of individual decisions. So if I choose to do something, can I do it really strongly or kind of just decide to do it? Do decisions come by degrees or are they a simple binary yes, no kind of thing? Hi Jennifer, how was that? Patrick shows me one of his okay, experiments good. in which he measures the brain activity of a subject when she makes a simple choice to push a button with her right hand or her left hand. Now we're going to ask you to develop an intention to go left or go right and then suddenly switch it to go right or to go left. So we're going to give you the arrow in the center of the circle right at the start, which explains the intention we want you to have. And then as the yellow circle rotates on the screen, it'll give a little very brief green flash. And that's a signal to you that you have to switch your intention to make the other action. Think left, switch, good. Think right, switch, good. And then we're just gonna leave you to get on with it and we'll be back in about five minutes, is that all right? Okay. Yep. Thanks very much, so. <laughs> go for it. Here we go. <laughs> Patrick shows me the results of his experiment. 
Initially, he ran a test in which he asked the subjects to choose simply right or left. In charting the brain activity, he uses a green line to represent the intention to go right and a red line to go left. When mid-trial, he then asked the subjects to change their minds, he noticed an interesting change in brain activity. So what we've shown here is a clear change in the position of the green and red trace on the y-axis at the point where the circle gave a little flash telling her to switch. What we can see is when she was originally intending to press with her right yeah, hand and was asked to switch, then this trace goes down and we can see it crosses over the trace that corresponds to intending to press with the left hand and switching to the right. We're trying to work out not only when intentions develop, but how they evolve over time, right. and in particularly how, how rapidly they can be switched, because it's very common that you develop an intention and then you might change your mind. Right. Perhaps you change your mind at the last moment, and actually perhaps that's really useful. So it might well be that one feels like punching somebody in the face. Yeah. That's not very good, but what's really bad is you, if you actually do it. Yeah. So it, the ability to change an intention or switch an intention or suspend it is probably extremely important in terms of self-control. Mm -hmm. In the long run, I think there's a very strong relation between the neuroscience of free will and the way that we control our behavior as, as social animals. Patrick raises a real-world issue, the social impact of how we characterize decision-making. Our justice system of crime and punishment is based on how we make decisions. If we are to be held responsible for an action, shouldn't it have been chosen freely? So is free will necessary for moral responsibility? This is one of the big questions that the Free Will Project explores. I turn to Roy Bauermeister, a leading social psychologist at Florida State, who ties the evolution of free will to the need for moral responsibility, reversing the traditional cause and effect. The idea of free will is that the person could act differently. A moral judgment is essentially a judgment about should that person have acted differently. The same with a legal uh, judgment, that should the person have done something else rather than rob the liquor store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the judgment that the person should act differently is based on the assumption that the person could act differently. Mm -hmm. So uh, to my way of thinking, uh, in this, at least in this very simple sense of free will, that is essential to moral responsibility. Now, the argument goes the other way, too. Why did we evolve free will? Why we develop that capacity? The ability to act morally is one of the crucial things that makes us human, that enables us to function well. Uh, one of the most basic norms is, is reciprocity. Uh, all, all other cultures do. If you do something to me, I should do it back to you. Um, that's a kind of moral idea. Um, but to control our behavior by it and actually pay someone back for it, uh, for, having, for something they've done for us, that, uh, that requires a sense of moral responsibility, requires that higher mentality. So developing this better sense of moral responsibility was crucial for our developing of, uh, of culture uh, and goes with this new way of controlling our behaviors that uh, you know, I think uh, goes by the name free will. If indeed free will and moral responsibility develop through evolution, science should tell us more about them. I ask Adina Roskies, a neuroscientist and a philosopher, who studies how brain imaging impacts philosophical questions. The first big breakthrough, in a sense, was putting people in the scanner and having them make moral judgments and looking at this really complicated activity and being able to see what parts of the brain are active mm. when people make certain kinds of moral judgments. For one thing, we can see that when people make judgments that doing harm is bad, for instance, mm -hmm. that uh, there are parts of the brain that are usually involved in emotional uh, reactions that are active. And it suggests that moral thinking, at least as normal people do it, is not a purely rational process. Oh, okay. If you've now shown that uh, emotions, uh, which we don't have conscious control over, we can't affect decision making, does that um, degrade the level of, of free will and moral decisions? 
there's no reason to think that we have to have control over every aspect of our decision making in order to freely choose. And we know we don't have control over all kinds of things. We don't have control over our genetics. We don't have control over our upbringing. We don't have a lot of control over our environment. Uh, and so the fact that there are parts of our brain that we don't have control over also doesn't seem to, to make it impossible to have free will. So I think there's a lot about free will that has to do with these uh, higher level executive processes and our ability to control our own reactions and ultimately what we're interested in is what are our actions, not what are our judgments or our thoughts. Do you ever envision a time where uh, brain scans can be used in some uh, legal forensic uh, approach to whether a person was fully responsible for their actions in a free will sense? Um, my prediction is it's not that far off, but no matter what the images say, you still have to make some kind of normative decision that isn't gonna come out of the images alone about what's our standard for responsible behavior. When is somebody so, uh, so impaired that they can't be held responsible? So that decision doesn't go away just because we have more fine-grained ways of looking at the brain. To Adina, Science will tell us progressively more about how the brain makes moral decisions. But science can never tell us whether a person is morally responsible for a given decision. That will always be a philosophical question. So I turn to philosopher Walter Sinnott Armstrong, who studies what we mean when we say someone is responsible. How do we decide what are the theories? So to say that someone's responsible is to say that they are the kind of creature uh, who is appropriately subject to some kind of negative sanction or punishment. Mm -hmm. Then there are gonna be a lot of different theories about when people are responsible in that sense. Uh, there are mesh theories where the question is whether your desires fit together in the right way. So an addict who can't control whether or not they take drugs well, they're still gonna be responsible if they're happy being an addict, but they're not gonna be responsible if they wish they could quit and they've tried and they, and they failed. Uh, the main competing theory in philosophy these days is the reasons responsiveness theory, that you're responsible when you're able to respond to reasons. First, you can detect when you have a reason to do something or not to do it, and then you act accordingly. If you have a reason to do it, you do it. If you have a reason not to do it, you don't do it. But I actually hold a theory that I think, in a way, captures both of the truths behind those approaches. Uh, it's called uh, the deep self theory. And the idea is that you're responsible for actions when those actions issue from you. One might say that the fact that your desires mesh in the right way shows that it's part of your deep self. You might say that the, the fact that you're responding to the relevant reasons shows that it's part of your deep self. There was an individual who lived in Virginia in the year 2000, and he was perfectly normal and started to collect pornography all of a sudden. And by the summer, he was collecting child pornography. And in September of that year, he molested his stepdaughter. They convicted him of child molestation. And by October, he was losing uh, coordination, and he was soliciting staff in the sex treatment program that he had been committed to. All of a sudden, they have to kick him out of this program, send him to jail. Right before he's sentenced, they do an MRI, and sure enough, he's got a big right orbital frontal tumor, which they take out, and when they take it out, he's fine. No more desire to have sex with kids. But then 10 months later, Tumor grows back, now he's got that desire back again. They take it out again, then it's gone again. It, it looks, for all the evidence that we've got, like the tumor is causing this behavior, not him. And what's making him do these things is something outside himself. And that's, I think, the basic intuition behind saying he's not really morally responsible. So the burden is gonna be, where do you draw the line between the tumor case and the normal person to be able to say these people are responsible and those people are not responsible. And my answer to that question is, there are gonna be degrees of responsibility. Part of the problem is that the law often wants to say, 
this person's guilty, we're gonna send them to prison, or they're not guilty and we're gonna let them out. That forces a dichotomy in a situation that really is essentially a continuum. Responsibility, judgment, guilt, punishment. The chain of causation begins with responsibility, which depends on our beliefs about free will. So, could our beliefs about free will determine how we exercise it? This is a question for social psychologists. Several are participating in the Big Questions in Free Will Project. I ask Al Muley, the director of the Big Questions in Free Will Project, to describe their work and its relevance. Al, many of the science uh, projects are in the social psychology of free will. What is that? What kind of progress have we seen? Uh, are you satisfied? Oh, I'm, I'm really happy with the results so far. So they're studying a variety of things in uh, social psychology of uh, free will. So the effects of people's beliefs about free will on their behavior is one. Another one is how people think about free will. One thing they test is the effect of lowered confidence that you have free will on your behavior. And one way to induce lower confidence is you make these fake newspaper stories where you have fake scientists saying there's no free will. And they had people read that, and then uh, they had a task in which they could cheat. Those people, the people who read the no free will article, cheated significantly more often than the control group who read just a, a neutral thing. Why do people behave worse when they read that there's no free will, mm -hmm. when their confidence mm -hmm. goes down. Well, it could be simple, like they're thinking, hey, I don't have free will, you can't blame me, I might as well go ahead, cheat and steal yeah. and, and behave aggressively. Another possible explanation is that people's motivation just to do things in general sort of goes down. So if they have these urges, uh, they don't have much motivation to combat them. You know, it's sort of, it has sort of a depressing effect, uh, let's uh, say, the uh, news that you have no free will. Uh, Roy Baumeister is doing some really interesting work on self-control, which is related to free will. If you have no self-control at all, then you're just going to act on your strongest urge, and you don't seem free. You seem more at the mercy of your urges. Self-control seems a novel approach to free will. I should learn more by asking about Roy's work. My goal as a research psychologist is to figure out what happens inside the mind and so forth that produces the behavior. I got into studying free will by virtue of my research on self-control. Self-control is difficult, so it depletes uh, some energy, and after that you're not as good at self-control until you, you replenish. Uh, when we found that the same energy is also used for decision-making and initiative, then I said, okay, well this is bigger than self-control. That's when we started talking about free will. Roy is conducting two kinds of experiments on free will. The first examines beliefs about free will and how they can change. Robert, this is uh, Michael Ent. He's a PhD nice student in our laboratory. You. Looking forward to the experiment. Okay. Yes. This was all his idea. He came up with the idea that we could uh, manipulate people's beliefs about free will by uh, manipulating their body's uh, states. Oh. Okay, so there's two conditions. Uh, participants in one condition, they demonstrate a voluntary response. So they bounce the ball in one hand and catch it in the other. They get the feeling of deliberately, consciously controlling their bodies, and that should increase their belief in free will because it, it calls attention to uh, how they mentally control about their actions. And then participants in the other condition, um, they have their involuntary reflexes triggered. So I blow a puff of air into their eyes, and then I shine a light to you know, stimulate their pupillary reflexes. Right, right. That's not something you use free will for. It's an automatic response. That should kind of cue you into the idea that your body works like a robot and that you don't have free will. Okay, so now I'm just going to have you complete this questionnaire about your beliefs and attitudes. And I'll come back in a Roy's day. theory proves to be correct. Subjects who perform voluntary actions report a stronger belief in free will, while subjects whose involuntary reflexes were triggered report a weaker belief. The important idea here is that beliefs about free will are, are flexible, are malleable, subject to cues even coming uh, inside ourselves. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the philosophers who've been debating this for, uh, for centuries haven't reached a decision yet because even each person's own beliefs might change. So uh, you know, what we might think of as a medical, physical opinion in this uh, very abstract way is in fact something that's influenced by cues coming from inside our bodies uh, and it can go up or down. 
Next, Roy investigates the individual psychology of free will, asking whether our capacity to exercise free will can change. In Roy's theory, making free will decisions takes energy. And since bodily energy is finite, the more decisions we make, the less free will we have. Roy and his assistant show me the experiment. First, we have people make a variety of decisions. This first task is a, is a choice task. So there's a variety of products on the screen. And I'll ask you to make choices between the two products, one on each side. And then we bring them over to the ice bath. And we put their hand in the ice water and see how long they can take it, both how long they wait until they can actually feel pain, and then also uh, how long they can last total. When you feel pain at first, say now, and when you can't bear the pain any longer, uh, remove your hand and, and say stop. To determine how prior choices affect subjects' willpower, Roy repeats this experiment, but with one crucial difference. Subjects view the same products, but now do not choose between them. This is the control. People in the control condition tend to last about a minute uh -huh. on average. Uh -huh. And after making choices, they only last about 45 seconds. That's a big difference if you think about it. It is. Yeah. So willpower is like a kind of muscle, exhausted by repetition. The more we use it, the harder to continue to use it. This means that free will has biological constraints. Is this a new kind of free will? Philosophers have been debating for centuries, yes or no, do people have free will or not? Mm -hmm. We should stop trying to give a yes or no answer to what people say free will and instead say, how hard is it or how much does it take for this person to exert free action? What are the things that will make free action easier, what are the things that will impede free action? For Roy, psychology shows the working complexity of free will, how we view it, how we exercise it, and what our capacity is for free action. So philosophers talk about free will, they will talk about exerting self-control, they'll talk about making rational, wise decisions that are good in the long run. Uh, but they had no way of showing that those are really linked in some, some fundamental way. Uh, but our research shows that, yes, those draw on the same research, they affect each other, they even have common underlying physiological bases and body and brain processes. So we can say, yes, there is some meaningful causal link between self-control and decision-making. So it is appropriate to put those together under the broader term to be called free will. And that way I think we can, we can advance the debate. As the yellow circle rotates on the screen. I think the work that we've been doing on this project suggests that if you do believe in free will, it may not be as strong as you think it is. Switch. It turns out that in terms of the brain's representations of the different actions that I do make or don't make, the code is actually surprisingly weak. We think we have a strong and determining will, but I think that our brain is always a little bit uncertain when it has to make up its own mind, as it were. I think one big lesson of this project is that any type of serious cooperation between scientists and philosophers needs to go on for years. They have to spend a lot of time working with each other in detail. It's only that type of sustained activity that's going to change the isolation of these fields. The end of the Big Questions in Free Will project approaches. It has been four years of study, research, experimentation, contemplation. Four years of thinking afresh about one of humankind's most profound questions. By bringing together diverse disciplines, philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, theology, the project enriches appreciation of primary questions and suggests avenues for further research. What I'm happiest about is that I was able to help bring together a lot of really smart people uh, who are very productive from a lot of different disciplines and get them to work together. 
the scientists in the project have gained new respect for philosophers. The philosophers have gained new respect for scientists. They're designing experiments together. They'll train new people to do this kind of thing. They'll keep working with each other. And this sort of interdisciplinary um, approach to philosophical issues will improve and increase. Free will has displayed its breathtaking scope from the electrical activity of a single brain to moral questions that affect all society. Free will is more complex than many had imagined, and the claims of some scientists that free will is an illusion have been tempered. What has been learned? What are the advances? What are the outcomes? What comes next? There is a truth of free will. We are now closer to it. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.